Good morning, friends, colleagues. Thank you so much. We've made it to the final for most. It's our final day here at the, at the Climate Week. So congratulations for your stamina and your energy and also for coming on a Friday morning. Uh, so thank you so, so much for your commitment and passion um, for being here. Uh, my name is Jimena Leiva Roche, and I'm the director of Global Initiatives here at IPI. And I'm, I am so grateful to be co-hosting this event with uh, the Oxford Climate Policy and Global Solidarity Levies Task Force. So thank you so much. It's been uh, great to collaborate with our partners here. And this event is a hybrid uh, event, so it's a, a, an unusual setup. We'll have the first part of the meeting uh, recorded so that people around the world can also listen to the presentations from Benito, Ali, and Lawrence, and then the recording will stop and we'll have a time to just have a chat and house uh, rule conversation around the table. So it is a bit unusual, but we thought that we could combine the best of both worlds. Um, so we're here today to explore one of the most promising areas of innovative climate finance, solidarity levies. As we all know, the financial needs to address both climate change and sustainable developments are immense. Meeting those goals requires significant and sustained financial commitments, and there's growing recognition that innovative solutions are necessary to fill the gaps left by traditional finance. Solidarity levies or targeted taxes and contributions represent one such solution. These mechanisms aim to generate revenue from those who are better positioned to contribute, such as high net worth individuals and polluting sectors, while channeling funds toward critical climate and development objectives. And friends, this is not new, right? We've had UNITAID that in the past has been a really great precedent that we can use now to do other such innovative uh, initiatives. And the momentum around these ideas is building. Last year at COP28, the Global Solidarity Levels Task Force was launched under the leadership of Barbados, France, and Kenya. Since then, We've seen significant developments in the global conversation around international taxation and climate finance, from the Africa Climate Summit's call for global taxes to Brazil's push for a global minimum wealth tax at the G20. The landscape is changing and rapidly. So even though these conversations and these ideas require a lot of leadership and are difficult, the potential for them is really enormous. So, as we explore these new tools, it is very important to ensure that the most vulnerable countries and communities are not unfairly burdened. Equity and fairness must remain central as we design and implement these mechanisms. With COP29 just in the horizon, today's meeting comes at a critical time. We'll be hearing from thought leaders and negotiators on the work of the task force, including proposals like the aviation levy, as we explore the next steps towards making these innovative financing tools a reality. So I want to thank you for being here. And we will start with hearing some insights from Ms. Laurence Tubiana, CEO of the European Climate Foundation. Laurence. Thank you very much, Jimena. Thank you very much for the International Peace Institute to host this discussion, a very, in my view, very important one. And it's so significant that the Peace Institute is really uh, working on this economic topic, climate, security, finance, uh, because that gives a dimension, because this is really to get in a very troubled world with so many conflict, uh, a place where we discuss about peace and development together. So thank you, and thank you, Jimena, for, for your remarks. Well, you, you may know me from Paris Agreement negotiation in 2015 already, so, so many years ago, almost 10 years, but I still we have still to fight for uh, the what is a corner uh, stone of the agreement implementation, which is finance. And we see uh, now and again, there's innovative source of finance, which is a discussion of today, is not new, uh, but yet it has not prevented donors Kony to to really be slow and even just raise the 100 billion per year we need, at least that was promised in Copenhagen already in 2009, uh, and that was so much time even to, re to, to, to reach there. So, but I think the conversation has changed. 
And you know, finance is uh, there is two elements of it in the Paris Agreement domain, uh, in particular the alignment of all financial flows uh, be behind uh, our global uh, warming targets, and at the same time the idea that we need solidarity in the system to implement decarbonization on one side and really to fund adaptation and now loss and damage on the other side. So we need this innovative source of finance, which have been repeatedly mentioned over and over, just now to land somewhere. And I think uh, I think the conversation has changed, and that's why I would maybe insist on the space we can get because of the NCQG, this terrible word, which I don't know who invented it, but I would like to meet him or her. Uh, needs to be concluded, and because the, the way I see, I feel the negotiation going on that, it's just very, very different from the past. Everybody understands that there is limited public money space, but we have to increase it, that one. The second is we have to articulate and give connection between the different sources of finance, and, and they are different de depending on the level of development of countries, and the, and the issues attached to, to that. And, and of course, the difference between mitigation action and adaptation and loss and, and loss and, and compensating for loss and damage. So I, I think, and uh, I, I would like now to talk about the Global Solidarity Levy Task Force. We launched that under the championship of uh, William Ruto, President of Kenya, uh, Maya Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, and Emmanuel Macron. Uh, and then we had, of, of course, all this discussion along the way. Uh, it's a very simple, which is just evident, no? It's sort of common sense. Um, we can't have carbon, uh, a carbon neutral world without justice. And uh, the justice is a lot of about tax, because we know that many flows, many actors, which really are contributing to the pollution of the atmosphere, and contributing to the damage we are facing in many countries and, well, now all over the world, and they are not contributing to the solution in, in, in a way in contributing factor. So polluters per principle is important. It's an old one, right? very old principle, I think, uh, back then, even before the Rio conference in 1992. But really some flows are not, you know, paying their fair share. So just common sense, how we can construct that, that it happens. And the second element is we, you, we know, and because of the debt situation in particular, we know we need uh, stable, predictable, and additional financial resources. And that's why increasing the contribution of high limiting industries that are on average very low and sometimes no zero taxpayers. And we have the aviation, the fossil fuels, the financial transaction, the shipping, different level of engagement, different level of contribution, but still most of these flows. And we could add, uh, and we see now that in particular the digital economy is generating uh, a lot of consumption of energy and certainly a polluting factor, and still of course it escapes to most of the of the of the of, the, of tax. So if the government can use these new resources for low carbon development, and in particular for the vulnerable developing countries, because the transfer and the solidarity element is really important, to meet the international climate and development financing commitment for developed countries. So, but at the same time, the logic is to find some tax justice based on the polluter principle. So when you look at the outcome of the global stock take, which called to accelerate the establishment of new and innovative source of finance, including taxation. So we should do it now. So I think now some countries beyond these three champions, and now of course there's a number of countries have joined this task force, we have the tax justice high on the political agenda, thanks to Brazil, which of course was a very important breakthrough at G20. UN tax convention, again, putting now in the time of reference the environmental taxes as a source of revenue and on justice. But it's not something revolutionary, even if it looks like nobody wants to talk about tax. You know, in the past, Un UNITAID adopted in 2006, thanks to President Lula and President Chirac at that time, gathered three billion for HIV AIDS. More than 30 countries do financial transaction tax. 
at domestic level and, and some of them and most of them transfer in, in this fund. We have more than 30 countries at world level. Again, small number, but meaning they are doing it. Levy airline tickets at domestic level and regional level. And that, of course, one of the proposals that will go fast, in my view, in the, at the European level. So we can do more now. And the, the, this task force is to explore technically and politically the options that can raise each of the one more than 100 billion a year. So that our bar, because of course, that will be a lot of a lot of works to, to get there. So we have to focus on the ones who can really contribute financially to the solution of the problem. A levy, for example, of windfall fossil fuel profits of 10% would have raised 3300 billion in 2022. And you remember, many of you, the enormous the profit had been quadrupled at that year. Only in one year, they went from 100 billion to 400 billion. To, so one trillion to four trillion, sorry, uh, just profit. And have, I, I saw a lot of fossil fuel subsidies coming out of the uh, public tr fund transfer. I haven't seen a lot of contribution on their side. So I think um, I think it's very space. And, uh, and that I think both developed countries and developing countries have an interest in doing so for the domestic resource mobilization, for securing resource, to increase international solidarity and maintain it because it's decreasing and collaborate to avoid tax-based evasion, which is of course a very important, but we have very important milestone in the future. The Finance for Development July 2025 is a very important milestone. I can tell you the, the equivalent before Paris was a, absolutely a necessity, a necessary step forward. So we need that and we need to land a number of options at that FFD next July. And then there is a COP30 in November 2025. And, uh, and you know, um, that will be 10, 10 years plus, the Addis Abeba meeting and the Paris meeting that will be on uh, 2025. I think, look, COP29 presidency have raised the idea to leave you a small tax on their fossil fuel production to fund a north-south financing mechanism and calling OPEC to do so. We should rally around that. I support that, we should all support that. It's a massive, it could be a massive step forward because for the moment it was really a taboo to discuss on this profit. So it could be a way, there are many options other, but this is, I think we should gather and, and bundle around that initiative of the COP21. But we need more countries to be even stronger and have the critical mass we need to succeed. Now, the task force is, in a way, in committed countries, only 12 countries, France, Kenya, Barbados, Spain, Colombia, Marshall Island, Antigua, Barbuda, Brazil, Senegal, Germany as an observer, and European Commission, African Union to support. We will be soon with a number of announcements tomorrow at the Global Citizen event, uh, more countries, and we will be around 20 very, very soon. But that's not the critical mass. We need many more countries to make this credible. So we need more oil and gas countries producing to join the coalition and push for a larger fossil fuel levy. It's important that Brazil wants to take a leading role in that task force because, you know, Brazil is a fifth producer of oil and exporter of oil. So it's a very important that they now see that this is a logic continuation of the um, of the of the G20 discussion on international tax cooperation, I think we have to find a seat for Avi. Yes. Who is? Thank you. So he has always a solution. Always Avi, a seat. yeah, <laughs> he always get the seat, and he always get the right solution and the very sort of practical way to handle. So it's so precious to have you, Avi, together with us this morning. So. Um, I think uh, the bigger the coalition of fossil fuel levy, for example, the coalition will be, the smallest will be the economic disadvantage for early movers. And there are different options. Again, we can discuss that when we will be uh, um, later on in the discussion. So we have a menu of options, the idea that countries can join to explore and commit to one option, at least at the minimum, shipping, while well, shipping is an international process, which just this task force is just supporting, the financial transaction tax, the aviation levy, and some other proposals that are coming to the table. So it, at COP29, while adopting an ambitious NCQG, uh, we, we need to recognize and encourage all the efforts to increase tax justice 
the levy element should be a part of the NCQG result. It has to be one source of revenue to get there. We need to identify the needs and to agree on the needs, and we need to identify the source of finance. And levy is part of the discussion. And of course, we have the UN tax convention. We have the uh, all the call to countries to join the, collab the global solidarity levy task force, and that will be a way, uh, in a way, to make, put that on the official agenda, and see, recognize the potential to unlock a number of uh, resources we cannot in the actual uh, situation. So that could give an energy that is for the moment lacking on NCQG, and I hope it will be really we can feel it in Baku uh, now less than two, two months away. Thank you, Remina. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think you gave us a really great landscape uh, and presentation on the options that we have ahead and on the leadership needed. Uh, so I, I, I think that's really great. And on the, and in on the second part, we do have like uh, Ambassador Filson, who is the finance negotiator for EOS, is here deeply embedded in the NCQG discussions. We have Fiji, we have Tuvalu, we have Barbados, we have a, a Denmark, we do have a, a Kenya, of course. And so we do have a number of countries that can uh, that can uh, can share with us their insights and how Tuvalu, the minutes, Vanuatu, Vanuatu as well. Um, so we have a lot of um, really great people around the table that can help us elucidate how we can get something at COP29 and then uh, FFD and then COP30. So with that, Ali, you have the floor. Special Envoy of Kenya. Well, well thank you, Penina, uh, and good morning, all. Um, uh, let me begin by, first of all, thanking API and uh, my friend Benito for <laughs> organizing this event here. And it's really so good to see uh, so many countries uh, around the table. Uh, when we launched it in at COP28, we were only three countries, so we felt uh, very more comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but now, at least with 12, it's, it's better than three. And uh, I hear what uh, uh, our secretary is saying will very soon be 20 something. And so that is re really great. And, you know, last year at the Africa Climate Summit, which was the first inaugural summit that we hosted in Kenya uh, by my president, in uh, the African uh, leadership, uh, you know, looked at um, uh, how to do things uh, outside the box. And we came up with a very ambitious uh, Nairobi declaration. And we looked at the whole issue of finance. And we explored innovative ways of raising finance for Africa's growth and development, which is really the main thing, but uh, towards that also contributing to the climate action. And in the Nairobi declaration, which was a really forward leaning uh, commitment and the suggestions, proposals from the African group uh, leadership was, um, there is opportunity to relook at the entire international financial architecture. There is opportunity to reform the financial system of the world that is, uh, has over the years impeded progress for most developing countries. And there is opportunity to see how additional financing can be raised beyond the, you know, the available public sources. So we explored and uh, suggested that shouldn't we be looking at levies as part of the new uh, financing uh, architecture? and. Uh, Lawrence has, of course, uh, uh, mentioned several of them. The, we explored the whole issue of maritime levies, aviation levies, FTTs, fossil fuel, uh, carbon taxation. And we mentioned all this uh, in our um, declaration. And so that is a commitment that uh, the African uh, leadership uh, 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 came up with. And we, we are committed to continue progressing that with as many um, uh, countries that uh, want to join the coalition of the willing and so and has the the, the launch at um, at COP28. Um, we're all aware the very ambitious and successful outcome of uh, the uh, COP28 with regard to energy transition uh, with the, the GST and we have seen the figures that have been uh, put forward by the uh, Carbon Policy Institute, for example, $9.0 trillion is required for us to attain the energy transition. 
And as you all know, Africa is one of the regions which is least, least uh, um, most affected by issues of lack of energy and energy poverty. Uh, last year, uh, my president has repeated to this several times during this session, $1.8 trillion was invested in energy transition uh, by the world, $1.8 trillion. So funding is available, we will get it right. But of course, again, the flow of that financing is something that we need to discuss. Uh, unfortunately, all of that is going to just particular areas, as we all know, you know, 90% of that went to just three broad areas, um, uh, China, US and EU. And Africa, uh, the continent of 1.4, got less than 3%. So financial flow, you know, and how that is happening needs to be to be discussed. In the, for sustainable uh, development goals, uh, CPI says we require additional 4.0 trillion, and um, uh, the UNEP UNEP's uh, reports says we require at least 400 billion per year for the adaptation goal. And you look at the adaptation gap reports, that's what it says. So the question is, where is all this money going to come from? And as um, uh, Penina and uh, Lawrence uh, already touched, we are now uh, in a month time going to, to Baku to discuss the whole quantum that we need to agree on. And as we all know, there are various suggestions or proposals on the table. I, I, I lead the African group and we from Africa uh, on the basis of, you know, uh, reports and assessments that have been done are pushing and uh, requesting that uh, the quantum should be at least 1.3 trillion per year by 2030. The other suggestions on the table, as, as we all know. But the question is, uh, how is this going to be achieved? And hence, the Solidarity Levy Task Force. And uh, as I said, uh, for the African group, uh, our leadership has already indicated how should we source, mobilize that, those financing in, in our Nairobi direction. So this is um, uh, a great thing. Of course, it is not just the mobilization or the quantum, the whole issue of the quality of the financing is, as I was just saying, where sh how should this finance flow? What kind of finance it is? You know, we are 54 African countries, 22 of us are in very serious debt distress situation. A number have already defaulted and a number are just on the blink of defaulting. So what is the quality of this finance? We cannot afford any additional financing that uh, uh, burdens us more and, you know, pushes us off the cliff. Uh, so the quality of financing is also very important. So we look forward uh, to partnering with more countries so that um, as we pro go to Baku and Belém, we have something tangible that you can present and then later on, of course, make sure that it is stream uh, streamlined in the uh, global discussions and the global negotiations. So, so thank you very much and uh, looking forward to positive discussions. Thank you so much, Mr. Mohammed. I think that your presentation really uh, brings to brings to uh, the stark reality of Africa and that fact that it's only 3% of those investments is just um, a ridiculous amount that has to be fixed as part of the equity discussion that we need to have. Um, thank you so much also for the leadership of your country in pushing these ideas forward. Uh, now uh, we go over to Mr. Benito Mueller, Managing Director at Oxford Climate Policy, who's going to be speaking on the aviation levy proposal. And he does have a... Benito, don't worry. <laughs> If you don't know Benito, you know, <laughs> he doesn't have a lot of patience, but we love him. <laughs> Fighting. No, you like, no, no, you like, you like things to be just perfect. And we appreciate that. So let's go. Okay, let's go. I can, while this is starting, uh, Laurence has already mentioned uh, the French Solidarity Levy for HIV AIDS 2006, proposed 2005. In 2006, I wrote a paper with Cameron Hepburn about an international air passenger adaptation levy. So that's how long I have been, 20 bloody years, okay? It's a long time. It, yes, <laughs> yes. Well, I was an advisor of the LDC group. The LDCs tabled it at Poznan. It didn't fly, pun intended. And I basically gave up, you know, at some point, uh, but when in Sharm, Farouk and Salim helped to decide that there should be a loss and damage fund, 
uh, I I just thought, wow, this is this is amazing. But my worries were twofold. This fund can either there are two scenarios which we do not want. It can be a placebo fund, where everyone likes it to be there, but it's empty. Or it can be a siphon fund, which basically siphons off the money from the other multilateral climate funds. So there's no doubt in my mind, given the fiscal uh, situation in developed countries, that we need innovative sources for this fund. And so Salim came up to me and basically said, well, let's, let's, re, re, uh, let's take this uh, aviation levy up again, but for loss and damage. So we wrote this piece together in 2003. I think this is one of the, I mean, the solidarity levies is the, the title which was there, the sort of the starting that sort of thing. But I, I, I'm eternally grateful. <laughs> No, I mean, I, you know, the one thing which I have learned in this process is you cannot take ownership of ideas because then no one will take them up. You have to make people believe they, they thought of it. Okay, that's the sort of... So I think this presentation will be available so you can then uh, download it. Let me just actually tell you a little bit about the, the French Solidarity Levy. Uh, 2006. It was proposed by uh, President Chirac and President Lula in September 2005. And what it is, is basically a differentiated uh, uh, levy on passenger tickets, differentiated by class and by destination. And you don't need to know the details things. But what is interesting is it was collected in a dedicated trust fund. So, so it's, it, it doesn't disappear in the treasury, okay? Because otherwise it's just gone. The, the fact that we are uh, having an, a levy on passenger tickets also makes it very predictable. The whole thing. So it is earmarked due to being in a fund and it's predictable. And uh, it, was, it was actually uh, managed by the Agence Française du Développement. And uh, hold on, wait, 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 how does that? There we go. In 2023, it collected. 370 million euros. The, the contribution to, to Unitaid was capped at 210, and the rest basically went to the Treasury, I take it. I, it's so so uh, there, there, there's something there which one can look at, okay? So this is the French levy, just to tell you, and you can... Now, this is in 20, 20, 20, uh, 2006. There is also in 2019, Fiji. Who is from Fiji? Good. You can, you can then follow up with me. I'll, I'll just explain. So basically, Fiji set up a, a trust fund for to support planned relocation activities, which is a, 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 a matter of slow onset loss and damage, right? And it is, it is uh, replenished in part by the environment and climate adaptation levy domestic right so so it is not i mean it is a purely domestic affair no international things involved i mean fiji wouldn't i mean mind getting international money or whatever but this this is the decision was purely country driven the point is the interesting thing is what is being levied in this thing i mean if, if you look at this thing it's hotel beds, it's licensed nightclubs. So it doesn't have to be airline tickets, right? The point, in, 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 and I call this, uh, I mean, if it were a, 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 a solidarity levy for, for loss and damage, it has to be easy to collect. And it is, in essence, domestic. Now, to the, the general concept, as I see it, of a climate solidarity levy is that you have national trust funds for loss and damage. That's a key thing. For example, you have the Fiji Climate Relocation of Communities Trust Fund, which replenishes it through domestic collection. You have the French one. Again, 
Now, the alliance, the, the idea of the alliance, that all this can be done by countries themselves without anyone interfering or the large negotiations at the multilateral level, just do it. You know, the one thing which I'm, I'm getting it old and I want things to happen now, okay? Because we can talk until the cows come home. I'm a Swiss originally, so that's my metaphor, okay? But I want something to, uh, if it's not trillions, I don't care. We will need the trillions or whatever, but at the moment, I want something to happen now. And this is happening, has been happening for 20 years in the case of France. It is doable, we know how to do it. And what the idea is of having an alliance, so countries who have these levies domestically can, can get together, and there's a benefit in there for developing countries. Namely, the idea is that the, the developed countries would, would put most of their funding for loss and damage into the loss and damage fund because they know they have to do it anyway. And it, it would actually sort of make the whole thing more predictable. And in my mind, it also uh, takes the headache away for treasuries because they know, they will know they have to do it otherwise every single year. They have to go through appropriations and things, and that's just nonsense. It has to be done. And in a case like that, it's, it's actually useful to earmark something. If, if Fiji were to decide to give something to the loss and damage fund, the idea then is the solidarity within the alliance is that in that case, France would give Fiji twice as much back directly into their domestic fund, right? So, so it's a pay, it's a it's a solidarity uh, payback uh, bonus. Fiji can show solidarity with other least developed and sits countries, and they are actually rewarded by multiplying their income for the domestic purposes. It's not Einstein the whole thing, and it also it it brings in a way in which we can, on voluntary basis, broaden the donor base without having to, uh, to have an international agreement on that. I mean, Fiji could not, need not do that, but if they want to do it, they have, there's a benefit in it. And you can read all this in the, this latest blog post. And how do we go forward now? Oops. Now we had this, right? Remember this? We had uh, the, the creation of the Global Solidarity Levies Task Force, or the, I will not mention the other name as it was. Just mention this. <laughs> no, no, no. We, 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 do not, we do not mention taxation. No, no. So, but how, how do we get forward? I remember who actually introduced the French proposed the French solidarity levy for HIV AIDS. It was Chirac, France, and Brazil, Lula. And how about this? Now, basically, I, I, I am convinced that President Lula is not adverse uh, to, to a legacy. And at the moment, this solidarity levy is sort of moribund, it just goes on and nothing happens. We can rejuvenate it. And in a sense, if you want a sort of a catchphrase, it was created for a pandemic, HIV AIDS. The new pandemic is loss and damage, which we have to equally look for. It will not, I mean, the, 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 the sums involved will not be trillions. But if more, more and more uh, countries contribute and, and, and come in, it will, it, you know, this is also a way in which you can get a global levy from bottom up in a way. And if one were to calculate how much uh, it could give, a, hypothetically, if everyone participates, it is eight, 10, 12 billion annually. So it's not, it's not to be sneezed at. Again, it's not, net, it's not all, but this is something where we can, we can create something now as we speak. We can, we can walk the talk now and see how we uh, can get there just to have something, right? Let's wrap up. I am wrapping up. There you go. So, so basically, the, the, the wrapping up here is, I am absolutely, this is not meant to supplant the idea of getting global levies. I am slightly uh, well, pessimistic, because, for example, if, if you go to a, a sectoral levy, I, uh, uh, IMO, they want the money for themselves. Right? They want it for the, for the shipping sector. 
IKEA will want it for aviation, not for loss and damage. So if we want to, uh, to contribute to the loss and damage effort of, uh, in the world, we need to have a different way of doing that. And we need to do it now. Thank you. Excellent, Benito. Thank you so much. And thank you for your leadership and uh, for keeping at it, you know? <laughs> so we really, really thank you for this uh, on behalf of everyone here, I feel. So now I would like to thank our online audience for being with us in this part of the event and wish you all a really great day. We will now move toward Chatham House uh, discussion, part of the discussion. So thank you.